Um, in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Um, we are in the, in the festive time of the resurrection now. Um, and uh, in the festive time of the resurrection, uh, we are celebrating the resurrection for 50 days. And so during that time, we are um, not fasting. We are not abstaining. Um, everything that we do in the church is chanted and prayed in the joyous tune. Um, and as I was uh, mentioning last Sunday, uh, this was called Thomas Sunday. Thomas Sunday because when the Lord appeared to the disciples on the, on the same day of the resurrection, St. Thomas was not there. Um, and when they told him that the Lord is uh, alive, he has risen from the dead and he has appeared to us, he did not believe. And he said, unless I touch him, unless I put my finger on his wounds, then I will not believe. And so eight days later, the, the following Sunday, the Lord appeared and St. Thomas was there. And of course, we know the story. The Lord told him, come and put your hand in my wounds and be a believer. Uh, and St. Thomas uh, worshipped him and believed. So it's actually one of the minor feasts of the Lord. Um, in the Coptic Church, we have seven major feasts and seven minor feasts. So this is one of the minor feasts and also called the New Sunday. So it's called Thomas Sunday and the New Sunday. Um, so last week, we learned the hymn of the resurrection. Um, the, the famous hymn, Christos Anisti. And the Christos Anisti is actually Greek. Um, so we'll review it today and then we'll learn the same hymn, but now in Coptic. Um, so in, during the Holy 50 days, we celebrate, as I said, the resurrection. So during, in every liturgy, we would have the procession of the resurrection that, that we do just on the Feast of the Resurrection, the same, same exact thing. Um, and we chant all of those hymns. We always chant the Christos Anisti. And it's supposed to be that the, at the end of the procession, we should chant the Christos Afton. Um, it's not always said, uh, it depends on the time, also depends on the deacons, whether uh, they, they know it or not. Uh, it's exactly the same as the Christos Anisti, but many of the deacons did not learn it. But we will learn it today, at least we'll learn to read it. So I would like us to review first the Christos Anisti. So can I have a volunteer to read uh, Christos Anisti? This we took last week already. Dr. Philippe, uh, would you like to read part of it? Christos Anisti, ik necron, thanato, thanaton. But Patisis K this in this M ni Messi Zo in Zo in Caristi Caris Simto Simtini Nos Caris Simtinos Caris Minos Caris Minos um, big word which uh, um uh, it means gift or to give, like uh, uh, charisma. Charisma means gift. Thank you very much. So, Christos Anisti, Christ is risen, Eknekron from the dead. Thanato, Thanaton, it's the same word. Thanato, Thanaton is the same. It means by death, he conquered death, or by death, he killed death. Bati says, Ketis and Tis, Imnimasi, and those who were in the tomb. So in Kheri he, Seminos, he bestowed eternal life. Um, here's, the, uh, uh, here's the translation. Trampling death by death, or uh, the literal meaning, as I said, is basically killing death by death, and upon those in the tombs bestowing life. And then the second verse we know, which is Um I remember last week I told you there's two ways uh, to, to chant this hymn. The, the, the more common uh, way is uh, the one that we hear most of the time. That's the one that, that is more common. There's also a shorter uh, version, which is the one that we learned last week. Which goes like Christos Anesti. 
I'm not going to review the whole thing because we learned that last week. If you were not present last week, uh, you can um, uh, review the recording. All the recordings, by the way, I, uh, I may have mentioned this before, um, are on YouTube. So if you go to my YouTube channel, just search for me, Gerges Gad, or, or search for uh, Coptic Rights class, you will find all of the lessons. So you can, if you missed any lesson, you can, um, you can review it. Um, so now we will learn the same hymn um, with, uh, with Coptic. So can I have, uh, have some volunteer to read for us? Uh, uh, yani, let's uh, take may maybe a few words at a time. So somebody can read for us uh, the first few words. Yes, Gloria, can you start please? Of Tonf Evol Hen Ni Ethmoot. Very good, very good. Thank you, Gloria. Um, the Echristos of Tonf, which means Christ is risen, of Tonf is to rise. Evol Hen from Ni Ethmoot from the dead. Christ is risen from the dead. Very good. Um, is Philo there with you, Gloria? Yes. Philo, would you like to read uh, the next set of words? Fi et of mo if homi ejen if mo o. Good. Fi et of mo of homi ejen if mo o. Again, the meaning here is trampling on death through death or by death trampling death. Very good. Okay, um, let's see who else. Any volunteers before I start calling on people? I can try. Sure, go ahead, Madam Nadia. Owo ni tek ni tek ki ni et ki yes hen ni em ha ni em hav. Yes, yeah. yes. Thank you. Very good. So, um, ni et ki, wo ni et ki chen pi em hav. Em hav is uh, the tomb. So, those who are and those who are in the tomb, wo ni et ki chen pi em hav. All right. Uh, and the last part, let's see who can read the last part. Uh, Thomas, would you like to try? Yes. Um, what's that second letter? In this the is word? the F. Right. F. Air. Of air. F. Air. Ehmoti. Ehmot. Ehmot. No. 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 No, it's a, it's a difficult one because three vowels. No, 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 Very good. Thank you, Thomas. So, um, of er ehmut, of er ehmut means he bestowed. Na'u, on them. Empi onch, the word onch means life. That's why it's taken actually from the ancient Egyptian, you know, the, the, the key of life. When you see, uh, yes, the onch, which is the key of life. It, it looked like a cross, but the top of it was a circle. 
and you see it in many of the um, like papyrus drawings. So you see like one of the gods, he is extending his hand and offering like the Pharaoh, the Onch or the key of life. Uh, so Onch means life in Ine, Ine means forever or eternal. Um, so it's the same meaning, Christ is risen from the dead. He who died trampling down death and upon those in the tombs bestowing eternal life. So I'll read the whole thing. We don't chant this in the short way. We only chant it in the long way. Um, we would we will not be able to learn this, of course, in in the few minutes that we have uh, in this class. But maybe for the next uh, ten minutes or so, we can at least be familiar with it. So I will chant the whole thing one time, and then maybe we can try to chant maybe some pieces of it. Okay. So uh, it's again it's very uh, the same hymn as a Christos Anisti, but just different words. This is now in Coptic. So how do we say? Be <speaking in Hebrew> So to be uh, maybe um, some people, if you have the, uh, if you're unmuted, maybe that's what causes that. Can you yeah, hear me when I just talk? It's yes, we can hear you. It's because everyone is not muted. So if everyone yeah. isn't muted, then we can't hear you. Okay. Bye. I will ask people uh, to mute uh, just so you can hear me chant the whole thing and then we can try to chant some of it, then we can uh, unmute, okay? Uh, I, I lost my spot. Oh, 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 me. ends the procession and then after that we start which everybody knows very easy maybe next week we can take the choice the choice is very easy uh, and also will give us a chance to like create some some more words 
So as I said, yeah, I mean, this is not uh, easy to learn in, in like 10 minutes here. Uh, so what do you think? Would you like to try to chant it uh, with me? Uh, or um, is that going to be a, you know, a challenge? They actually never, never uh, say it in Coptic. They always use the Greek. Yeah. Uh, on, on the Feast of the Resurrection, typically they say it. But during the regular days, like the regular Sundays, because the procession is usually faster, um, so we don't get a chance to say all of the hymns. You know, there's there's a Christos Anesti, then there's to, uh, so typically what happens on the feast, we say Christos Anesti the long way, then we say Christos Anesti the short way, and then we say Tonsina, it's a, it's a Greek hymn, and then Tulitos is another Greek hymn, and then Be Christos, so that's five hymns. Some churches also say Tin Anastasin. That's uh, another Greek hymn, so then that's six hymns. But on the Feast of the Resurrection, of course, everybody's there, all the deacons are there, so the procession takes a lot, you know, a lot of time so we can finish all of those hymns. But on like regular Sundays and definitely during like uh, liturgies in the middle of the week, there aren't that many deacons, so the procession is faster. Um, so most of the time, you are correct, uh, we don't say be Christos of Ton. Um, I, I, but I wanted you to be familiar with it, to at least have heard it one time. And more importantly, I wanted us to read the words. So now we know Christos Anesti is actually Greek, but Be Christos Aftonf is the Coptic. So really, when we greet one another, if we want to greet correctly in Coptic, we should be saying Christos Aftonf uh, instead of Christos Anesti. But Christos Anesti is more common. Um, and we kind of picked that up from the Greek Orthodox Church, and it became kind of the, the main greeting, which is which is okay. But now you know the difference between them, and you know the two hymns uh, that are available. Okay, um, so I wanted us today to uh, learn about the rites of Bright Saturday, and I know that this is already passed, but we didn't have uh, enough time to learn about it before. Holy Week, we focused on the rites of Holy Week. Um, and last week, we focused on the, the rites of the resurrection itself. Uh, but I want us also to learn about Bright Saturday. Um, if you have not attended it before, uh, this is a very beautiful um, uh, visual to attend. Uh, this is the time when the Lord Jesus Christ was in the tomb. Uh, so when we finish all the prayers of Good Friday, the very last prayer is the 12th hour. This is the prayer of the burial. And so we bury the icon of, of the Lord on the altar. And then we don't just like go home and sleep and that's it. And just leave the Lord alone. Because I was talking to some people and I said, did you go to, uh, did you go to Apocalypse Night, Bright Saturday? And they said, no. And I said, so he left the Lord all alone by himself in the tomb. He did not go and like, you know, sit around the tomb with him. Um, you know, me, uh, I think the Lord was feeling lonely. He wanted his friends to be around him. So this is actually a beautiful night where we come uh, and sit around the tomb of the Lord, awaiting the resurrection. And what are we doing while we're awaiting? We're not going to be chatting or watching TV. We are actually praising him and singing songs and, and beautiful readings. This is the night when we read the, the entire book of Revelation because Revelation tells us about heaven. And because the Lord, <clears throat> uh, because of his salvation and his resurrection, he lifted us to heaven. And so now we are anxious uh, to learn about heaven. So we'll learn about um, the, um, the night of the apocalypse or as it's known uh, in, in Arabic as Abu Ghalamsis. What does the word Abu Ghalamsis mean? Abu Ghalamsis is apocalypse, but it, uh, yani the, uh, in the Arabic language, it was corrupted because apocalypse is difficult to say, so it became Abu Ghalamsis, but it's not like Abu Ghalamsis, like, like somebody called the Ghalamsis and this is his father. No, it's apocalypse or apocalypse, which means the revelation. So what do we call this night? We call it um, Bright Saturday. Bright Saturday or the Saturday of Light, Sabtin Nur. Um, 
for a couple of reasons. Uh, number one, because Christ, our true light, has given, given us light. Um, and this is actually the, uh, uh, the, the psalm that we chant on, um, on the resurrection feast. We say, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Um, o Lord, save us. O Lord, straighten our way. Uh, Christ, uh, the, the Lord, uh, is God, and he has given us light. Um, so through his resurrection, he has given us light. And so as we are in, in anticipation of the resurrection, so we call this day in between the crucifixion and the resurrection, the Saturday of light. Also, it's known as the Saturday of light because of the miracle of the light that comes out of the tomb, of the, the, the empty tomb of the Lord in, in Jerusalem. And I've personally seen this light, and many people have seen this light. So uh, if you're not familiar with what happens, um, on this day, on Bright Saturday, uh, the, the um, Armenian uh, uh, Orthodox patriarch, he goes inside the tomb. Um, sorry, uh, the, the, uh, the, the Greek Orthodox uh, patriarch, a room, he goes into the tomb. And he has with him the veils that were um, on the body of the Lord. And so he takes these veils and he does very deep prayers um, uh, on top of the tomb. And during these prayers, light comes out of the tomb of Christ. And this light has a very um, special characteristic. For the first 33 seconds, um, this light does not burn. So it's fire, but it does not burn. And that's why you see some pictures of people, they hold the candle um, on their face or on their hand or on their beard and it doesn't burn. Why 33 seconds? Because the life of the Lord was 33 years. So for the first 33 seconds, this light has a, a different nature than, than fire. Yes, you can light candles with it, um, but this light doesn't burn. After 33 seconds, uh, it changes nature and becomes regular fire. And that's it, it, like you could actually get burned if you put it on your hand. Um, so this is a, a standing miracle um, that testifies to the resurrection of the Lord. Number one, the tomb is empty. And not only is it empty, but there's a miracle that happens every year that testifies to the resurrection that the, the one who was in there was the true light. And that's why he gives us light every year. It's also called Joy Saturday or Saturday of Joy um, because we celebrate the, the salvation. And so we are rejoicing at the salvation of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's also called Apocalypse or Apocalypsis or in Coptic T, Apocalypsis. It's all the same word. And this means revelation because we read the entire book of Revelation um, on this night. So. What are the rights of, um, of the uh, apocalypse? Um, there is one theme throughout everything that we do, and the theme is death and resurrection, because we are in the, in the middle of the death and the resurrection. The Lord died on the cross. He gave us uh, salvation, but our uh, joy is incomplete. Our joy is complete with the resurrection. So we are waiting. So everything we do, centers around death and resurrection. Um, so we, we, we uh, put candles all over the church. We adorn the church with candles. Uh, we open the sanctuary, as you see in the picture here. Uh, if you remember during Holy Week, almost all the prayers were outside the, the sanctuary and the sanctuary was closed. Why? Because at that time, we were not allowed into heaven. We were not allowed even to look at heaven. So that's why it was closed. And even the light um, in the church, we, we don't light the lights inside the, all, inside the sanctuary. We only light the lights in the, in the church nave. Um, but after the crucifixion, um, open, uh, heaven is now opened. And that's why we open the sanctuary at the 12th hour on Great Friday. And we keep the sanctuary open um, in all the services until the liturgy of the resurrection. Even after bright Saturday, when we go home and we come back in the uh, Saturday night for the feast, there is a um, 
midnight praises that are that are prayed before the liturgy. And this midnight praises, we always, we also open the sanctuaries, and it's the only midnight praises in which we pray it with the sanctuary open. And it's the only midnight praises that we have a procession inside the, the sanctuary. It's a very special uh, rite. And then we also see um, something, you see it in the picture here, you see something wrapped in white linen. This is the book of Psalms. So we take the book of Psalms and we wrap it in linen um, because this is the night of praising and praising all comes from the Psalms. The Psalms are praises. And we begin this uh, night with uh, chanting Psalm 151. Uh, so uh, David uh, wrote, most people think 150 Psalms, but there's actually in, in the Coptic rite, there's Psalm 151, which tells us the story of David and Goliath. Um, and so we begin the night with chanting Psalm 151. Of course, white is a symbol of purity and victory. Um, we also know something different uh, when we chant the praises. We chant, we chant them antiphonally uh, inside the sanctuary and outside the sanctuary. Typically, when we chant the praises, we go you know, north and south. But now we are chanting from inside the altar and outside the altar. Why? Because the heavenly and the earthly are celebrating this great event of, of the salvation and the resurrection. What is the layout of, of this night? So first we have the praises and the prayers of the prophets. And during that, we have two processions. We have one procession right after Psalm 151. And then we have a, the second procession after we read um, the, the story of uh, the three young men and we end with the story of Susanna, which we'll touch uh, on today, then we have the second procession. And then we have raising of incense, matins, um, and then we have the third procession. So there are three processions during this night. And then we, we start praying the Agbeya again. If you remember during Holy Week, we did not pray anything in the Agbeya. Instead, we were singing Thok Tetigom. So now we start to return back to praying the Agbeya, but it's a little bit different. So we, we, we pray the Psalms of the Agbeya, but then we don't read the gospel that's in the Agbeya. Instead, we chant uh, a Psalm and a gospel that is related to the event which we are in again, which is death and resurrection. So we pray the, pr the prayers of the third and the six hours, and then we begin to read the Apocalypse or the book of Revelation. And at the end of the book of Revelation, we get anointed with the oil. So when we pray, uh, when we read the apocalypse, we have uh, seven um, uh, oil uh, candles. Um, and then we take from this oil, Abuna takes from this oil and he anoints all of the believers with that oil. Um, and then we pray the ninth hour and then we pray the divine liturgy. So this is the structure of um, the, the night of apocalypse, very similar actually to the structure of a liturgy, right? What do we have in the liturgy? First, we have midnight praises, which we have here. And then we have raising of incense, which we have here. And then we pray typically the third and the sixth hour, like on Sundays, which we have here. Um, extra here is the book of Revelation. And then we have the ninth hour and then we have the divine liturgy. So Psalm 151, um, as I told you, it tells us the story of David and Goliath. Um, and it's written by David. So he's saying what? I was small among my brothers and the youngest in my father's house. I tended my father's sheep. My hands made a harp. My strings fashioned a lyre. So this is his early life, right? He's, he's small. He is not, uh, you know, he's insignificant among his brothers. He's the youngest one. And he was a shepherd, that's all he did, right? But he was a singer also. And then he continues and he says, and who will tell my Lord, the Lord himself, it is he who, who hears. It was he who sent his angel and took me from my father's sheep and anointed me with his anointing oil. So the second part of, of the life of David is that he, be, he became anointed to be the anointed one. And he was anointed king and he was anointed as a prophet. Um, and so God basically, you know, he's, he's like 
uh, it's like poetry. God sent his angel and, and took me from sh being a shepherd and made me a shepherd of the people instead of a shepherd of sheep. And he anointed me with his oil. And then he continues. My brothers were handsome and tall, but the Lord was not pleased with them. I went out to meet the Philistine, that's Goliath, and he cursed me by his idols, but I drew his own sword, I beheaded him, and I took away disgrace from the people of Israel. Alleluia. Um, it's a very short psalm, but a very beautiful psalm, and especially when it's chanted and it's tuned. If you were here a couple of minutes before we started, I was playing um, uh, the chanting of Psalm 151. Um, so why do we why do we chant this and, and use it to begin this night of the apocalypse? The story of David, of course, David was a foreshadow of the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, in the story of David here, we see how God transferred him from poverty to glory. As he said, I was a shepherd. I was tending my father's sheep. And now God sent his angel and he took me from being a shepherd of sheep and made me a leader, made me a king. And then he also talks about how he himself transferred the people of Israel from shame to disgrace, to salvation, to victory by slaying Goliath. Um, so who is Goliath here? Goliath is Satan. Um, and David represents the Lord Christ. And how did he slay him? By the cross. So now you see it makes sense. So David represents the Lord Jesus Christ, who slew Satan and beheaded him, means took away his, his power by the cross. After we finish uh, chanting Psalm 151, we begin the first procession. And the first procession is the lupsh of the second host. What does the, the word lupsh means explanation. Um, so in, in the midnight praises, we have four hosts. The second host talks is a host of thanksgiving. And so it begins with, let us thank Christ our Lord with David the psalm. So we just heard the story of David. So now we are going around the church, thanking Christ with David the psalmist. Um, the entire congregation participates in this procession with crosses and candles. And this is the only night where everyone can participate in the procession. So deacons, men, even men who are not deacons, even ladies, women, girls, kids, everybody participates in, in these uh, three processions in, in Abu Ghalamsis. It's the only night where the entire congregation participates. And it, there is, of course, a reason. There's a reason for everything. Because in, in these processions, we are celebrating salvation. So salvation is for everybody. Uh, in, in, in the other, when we talked last week about the, the procession of the, um, of the uh, resurrection, we said that the deacons represent the righteous, the saints. So not, we don't see like the whole congregation going around the church. We just see the deacons. Uh, different meaning. In, in, the, in the bright Saturday, the meaning here is everybody. The salvation is for everybody. God grants salvation to everyone so everybody can participate in this, uh, in this procession. Um, so we, we celebrate, we proclaim our joy in the salvation of the Lord, which he has fulfilled on the cross. Um, and as, as we said, it follows Psalm 151 to show our joy in the salvation over Satan, who is depicted by Goliath. After we finish this first procession, we come back uh, to, to the front of the church and we chant the first host or the first praise. The word host means praise. And this is the praise of Moses the prophet when they cross the Red Sea. What does this have to do with, um, with uh, uh, Apocalypse and Bright Saturday? Who can tell me? Why, why do we chant uh, the first host? What does Moses crossing the Red Sea have to do with, um, with, with, uh, with, I'll give you a hint, with the theme of, of that day. Yes, Thomas. Uh, he saved the Israelites just as God saved uh, his people. Right, he saved the Israelites. So we, what did we say the theme of this night was? It was two words. 
death, death and resurrection. Yes, death and resurrection. So when, when Pharaoh came after the people of Israel, when they left Egypt, um, they looked in front of them and they, they saw the Red Sea. And they looked behind them and they saw Pharaoh. So what happened? They were dead. They had the sentence of death. If they try to go into the sea, they will drown and they will die. If they stay where they are, they will die because Pharaoh is going to come and he's going to kill them. So this was death. They had the sentence of death. When Moses hit the Red Sea with the rod, and the rod here is the cross, he split open and he created a path that did not exist before. This is salvation. We did not have a path to go back to heaven. Um, since Adam was cast out of heaven, heaven was shut. So Christ, when he came and he struck the sea with his cross, and the sea here is the temptation in the world and, uh, and Satan, when he struck it, he opened the path for us. And so we were able to walk through this new path into salvation. So this is death and resurrection. Um, Again, Pharaoh here represents Satan. Satan is coming to kill us. Satan is coming to get us. And there's no way out. Only through going through the Red Sea. And the Red Sea also represents death. What kind of death? The death of baptism. So that's why even St. Paul said that the people of Israel, Israel were baptized through, uh, the Red, uh, uh, by Moses through the Red Sea. So they actually went through baptism um, in the Red Sea. Uh, this praise is called the praise of the Lamb. And so in, in Revelation, when we, read, when we read it, we read, it says, they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. Um, so this is also another reason why we chant this on this night. And then we have a, a, a long list of prayers that we pray um, during this night. And we'll just take two examples of them. Um, so we have the prayer of Hannah, the mother of Samuel. We know the story. I hope we all know the story. Hannah did not have any children, and she cried to the Lord. And the Lord gave her um, her son, Samuel. And so he, she, she vowed that if God gives her a son, that she will uh, dedicate him to the temple. And so when Samuel was, I believe he was two years old, uh, she brought him to the temple, and she actually said a very nice um, a phrase. She said that I will lend him to the Lord. Um, what does it mean, I will lend him? That means she still feels it's her son, yes. But since she promised that she would um, dedicate him to the temple, to the service of God, so she lent him to the Lord with the hope, again, in the resurrection, that she will get him back later. So you see the, 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 the mind of, or the dogma of, re, of the resurrection was in the mind of all of these righteous people, even before the Lord came. And so this prayer that we pray is the thanksgiving of Hannah um, when she came back to the temple and she brought her son uh, into the temple. Again, here's death and resurrection. Her womb was dead. She was barren. She couldn't have any children. So her womb was dead. But out of this death came forth life. So this is death and resurrection. Samuel came forth from a dead womb. Um, and there's also a prophecy in, in, her, in her praise about the, the salvation of God. The, adverse, the adversaries of the Lord shall be broken in pieces. From heaven he will thunder against them. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. And so likewise, the church thanks God, just like Hannah thanked God for grant, granting her a son, who is the Lord Jesus Christ. So Samuel here also is a symbol of the Lord Jesus Christ. Another example is the prayer of Jonah the prophet. Who can tell me, again, why do we read Jonah the prophet on this night? What does Jonah have to do with this? Noah? Um, Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days, so that represents the Lord in the tomb for three days. Very good. And again, if we go back to the theme of death and resurrection, he was basically dead. He was inside. It was a living tomb, but he was inside of a tomb. So basically he was dead, but he came back uh, alive when, when, the, when the whale, you know, spit him out. Um, 
and there's many symbols between Jonah and Christ. So again, Jonah here is a symbol of the Lord Jesus Christ. As, jo as Noah said, three days in the belly of the fish, like the Lord was in the tomb for three days. He was condemned to death, but he remained alive. By his death, the ship was saved, just like by the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, we were all saved. Um, the, the seamen, when they threw him into the, into the water, they did not see any hope for saving his life. Just like the Jews, when they killed him, they did not expect him to come back to life. Um, and he also entered into a place where no man has ever entered before. Nobody has ever entered into the, the belly of a, of a fish and came back alive. Um, this is just a, a comment here. Um, the Jews, um, they have a feast called Yom Kippur right? You, you may see it like on the calendars, Yom Kippur, which means the great day, Yom Kibir, the great day, which is the day of atonement. On this day, they read the prophecy of Jonah. And if you, if you have any Jewish friends who, who know like the, the, the rites, you will ask them, uh, what, why do you read the, the prophecy of Jonah on Yom Kippur? And they cannot answer you. They don't know why but they do it. They will say our rabbis taught us, you know, way back when, because they are still stuck in the Old Testament. They have not made the transition into the New Testament. They have not accepted that all of these things were a symbol for the Lord Jesus Christ. If they understand that, they would understand that on the day of atonement, they are reading the prophecy of Jonah because Jonah was a symbol of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as, as all of these things that we just said, that he brought salvation, but they are missing that point. That's why actually St. John uh, in his, uh, at the end of his gospel, if, if you read carefully, um, he says, and many other things G uh, Jesus did, which were not written in this book. And if they were written in this book, I don't think the whole world would, contain the the books that would uh um that that you know uh, that that would need to be written uh, for all of these works but these were written so that you may believe that jesus is the christ this is the whole point of the gospel that, that you may believe that jesus is the christ and that's what's missing in the jewish uh, religion until today they have not made that transition that jesus is the christ um, that's why we are called Christians, because we, we believe in Jesus being the Christ. Um, towards the end of all of these readings, as I said, I said, as I said there are many readings. We're not going to go through each one of them, but I just give you two examples. Um, we have a big section that is related to the three young men, the three young men and the fiery furnace. Again, I hope we know the story uh, when King Nebuchadnezzar made a, a great statue and he said all the people must worship. But the three young men, the friends of Daniel, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abdenego, or Hana, uh, their names also uh, Hananiah, Azariah, and Mish uh, Mishael, um, they refused to worship because they worship God. And so the king threw them into the fiery furnace. And um, the angel of the Lord, and the angel here is with a capital A, so it's actually the Lord Jesus Christ himself. He appeared to them in the flame, and he smote the flame of, of the furnace. And so they were walking as if they're walking in a garden. As a matter of fact, it said that he made the flame into a mist, uh, into like, a, uh, like an air conditioned uh, room, basically, because there, there was moist and, uh, and uh, like a mist in, in the air. So not only did he just like push down the flames, but he made it pleasant. Of course, it makes sense. When you are in the presence of the Lord, everything will be pleasant. Even the, the fiery furnace will be pleasant. Um, so we have a number of readings. We have the prayer of uh, the prophet Daniel. We have the vision of Daniel uh, regarding the three young men, which tells us the story. And then we have the, pr the praise of Azaria, which is the third host. So now if we recount, we prayed the lupsh of the second host, and then we prayed the first host, and now we prayed the third host. So three of the hosts are prayed during this uh, this night. Um, and the, the third host is prayed with a, a very beautiful uh, tone. If logi te pantata erga kiri eton kiri like that. 
um, very, very nice and only chanted on, on this night and that tune. Um, we also chant Arif Salin, which uh, everybody loves that hymn, Arif Salin, right? And we also chant Tinin. And then we read the rest of the story of the three young men. Why the focus here on the three young men? Again, death and resurrection. They were condemned to death, but they came out alive, just like all of humanity was condemned to death, but the Lord granted it life. Um, whoever wishes to see the Lord must pass through the fire. The, the fire here, and I talked about this before when we talked about uh, some of the uh, topics on the praises. Um, the fire here represents the temptations of the world. So we must overcome this. We must pass through it in order to be with the Lord and uh, to, to, uh, to gain the presence of the Lord. Uh, the salvation of the three young men from the fiery furnace is a symbol of the salvation uh, from the eternal fire. Then we have um, some praises of uh, the prophets in the New Testament, like the song of St. Mary, uh, the prayer of Zechariah the priest, when, when he held the Lord in his hand and he said, Lord, now you're letting your servant depart in peace for my eyes. I've seen your salvation again here. What is the whole point of this night? It's salvation, death and resurrection. Uh, sorry, uh, that was uh, Simon the elder. Zechariah is when he, when uh, St. John the Baptist was born and he praised God and he talked also about the salvation of the Lord. And then we have the story of Susanna, a beautiful, beautiful story. Um, and this is written in the book of Daniel. But if you have like um, New King James uh, Bible in your hand and you, you look in the book of Daniel, you will not find the story of Susanna. It's in the, the completion or the rest of Daniel, which is uh, considered part of the deuterocanonical books. Well, we can talk about the books of the Bible another time and explain that. But um, the New King James Version, this is a Protestant canon. If you look at a Catholic Bible, you will find the story of Susanna. And if you look at an Orthodox Bible, you'll find the story of Susanna. What is the story of Susanna? Very briefly, um, she was falsely condemned, although she was innocent. Um, and she was uh, uh, um, condemned to death. But she resurrected, or she came back, or she was saved uh, by Daniel and at the fullness of time, just when they were about to stone her. Again, this is all a symbol of the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, we can talk about the story of Susanna maybe next week. Uh, I, I love that story. It's a very beautiful story and has a lot of uh, beautiful symbolism. Uh, here's a, a picture that I found, uh, Susanna here being condemned to death. Um, and this is Daniel when he stood up and he defended her. And these are the two elderly um, judges who falsely accused her and were going to put her to death. Um, after we read the, the story of Susanna and, and we see this beautiful salvation that the Lord um, has, um, has made for Susanna, um, then we begin the second procession. So the first procession was after Psalm 151. The second procession is after the story of Susanna. And this is the praise of the three young men um, that starts with, we follow you with all our hearts, then we and so. Um, the praise of Azariah while he was in the fiery furnace. There's a question about what chapter would it be in the other versions? Uh, I, I don't recall off the top of my head. Um, that's a good question. I, I can look it up and uh, actually next time, next time I think we'll talk about Suzanne and we'll, uh, we'll answer that. Um, so um, here Azaria, after coming out of the fiery furnace, he proclaimed saying what we will follow you with all of our hearts, even under any condition. And now that you have been saved from the fiery furnace, what else, Yanni, what else can, can anybody do to you? If, if people have thrown us into the fire and the Lord appeared to us and he brought us out safe. So here, Yani, Azaria leads us in this praise where we say to the Lord, we will follow you with all of our hearts. 
whether we're in the lion's den, like Daniel, we will follow you. Whether we are in the fiery furnace, we will follow you. Whether we are being condemned to death falsely like Susanna, we will follow you. We will follow you with all of our hearts. So we go around the church proclaiming that we will follow the Lord with all of our hearts. Um, now that we have heard all the prayers and the praises of the salvation, um, you know, there's, there's nothing left to say to the Lord except, Lord, we will follow you no matter what. We will follow you with all of our hearts. A very beautiful rite. Um, <clears throat> after we, we come back from the procession, then we start the raising of incense. The raising of incense, it has a special rite. Um, uh, so we say the Thanksgiving prayer, then we pray the morning doxology, and then the litany of the departed. If you remember when we talked about the raising of incense uh, a few months ago when we started this, this course, we said that the, the litany of the departed is only prayed on Saturday mornings um, when we have raising of incense on Saturday. Why? Because it's the remembrance of the Lord in the tomb. So if we have a liturgy on any other day, like on Sunday, and you, and you come and attend the raising of incense on Sunday, we don't pray the litany of the departed. If you come on Wednesday or Friday or Tuesday or any other day, we don't pray the litany of the departed. Only on Saturday morning do we pray the litany of the departed because we, this is the day when the Lord was in the tomb. Then we have the beautiful praise and the melody, which everybody, um, I hope everybody has heard and, and, and enjoys. The one that's Agiyoth Asanatos Nainan, which means holy or immortal, have mercy on us. Agiyoth Asanatos Nainan, like that. Um, and then we continue the, some praises, the Saturday Theotokeia and then the doxology. And then Abuna says, if no Tinainan, just like, um, you know, we do in the regular raising of incense. And then we chant Kyrie and Ison three, uh, three times in the long way. Amin and then we have the third procession. So as I said, there are three processions on bright Saturday. The first one is after Psalm 151. The second one is after the story of Susanna. And the third one is after uh, If Nuti Nainan when we chant Kiri Alaisun. Then we chant the, the Pauline, the Trisagion, the Psalm and the Gospel. Everything is chanted half mournful and half annual. Why? Because we're in a transition period. We are still sad because the Lord is still in the tomb. Our, our joy has not been completed yet because he hasn't risen yet. The resurrection hasn't happened yet. But we are getting there. Like it's, it's like we, we, we can see it. We can almost taste it, but it's not there yet. It's like, you know, you have a fence, like, you have the, like the fence you have between you and your neighbor, right? And uh, your neighbor's yard has like all of these games and they have a bungee jumping and a pool and uh, a lake and everything like that, right? So you can, you're like looking over the, the fence and you can see all of these things. Like you're almost there. All you have to do is like jump over the fence or, or go through the gate to get to there. Uh, but you're not there yet. So this is exactly, this, this night is a transition. We can see the resurrection. We can feel the resurrection. As a matter of fact, many of the readings, like the gospel readings, they're all about the resurrection. And they tell us that the Lord rose. The, the, the liturgy of the, the, sorry, the Psalm of the liturgy is about the resurrection. And it says that the Lord has risen. So we're kind of, again, in this, in this middle state, this transition state where we can almost see it, but not there yet. Um, as I said, you know, we, we pray the, the Agbeya prayers. Um, and then we pray uh, the apocalypse. We read the book of Revelation. So we light seven oil lamps and seven candles. And we put a cross in, in the middle, like you see in the picture there. Uh, the, the cross resembles Christ. And the seven candles resembles the seven, um, the seven stars or the seven churches that the, the, the letters in the book of Revelation were written to or the seven angels of the seven churches. Angels here are like the priests or the, the bishops of those churches. Um, and, and we light seven censers. Um, 
and then we begin chanting the very beautiful hymn of Ten Oos, Ten Oos, we worship the Father and the Son. And every time uh, we read the word incense in, in Revelation, then Abuna would raise incense. So it's, it's like a 3D experience, right? We are reading, we are listening, and we are also experiencing. We, we see the, the candles, we see the oil, we, we smell the incense. Um, we read this between the sixth and the ninth hour because this is the period of salvation between the crucifixion and the resurrection. And what does the book of Revelation tells us? It reveals to us heaven. It reveals to us the paradise uh, to which Christ took the right hand thief and all the righteous. It reveals to us heaven, which is now open and we are eligible to look at. That's why the sanctuary is open and stays open. Um, it also portrays the, um, the continuous struggle between um, good and evil, right? The, the book of Revelation is seven revelations, all ending with Christ's victory. And it's a journey from earth to heaven. This actually, you know, this, uh, we can talk about the book of Revelation another time and, and really understand the beauty of it, because I know it's a book that m maybe many people do not read. They're afraid of <laughs> reading it. Uh, there's a lot of symbolism, a lot of prophetic words, and they don't understand it. But truly, this is the, the most beautiful book in, in the whole Bible. Uh, and if we understand how to read it, then we will enjoy it very much. So the book of Revelation is a journey. It's our journey from earth to heaven. How do we get from here to there? What are the struggles that we have to go through? Seven struggles, seven revelations. And each one of them ends with the victory of Christ. And all the way at the end, in chapter 20, um, uh, 22, we see heaven. So again, we are looking for, we look, to, we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the age to come, amen. During the, the reading of the apocalypse, we interject some very important points and we chant about it, like the messages to the, to the angels of the churches. Um, we say, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches in a very beautiful uh, hymn. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. It's very beautiful. Um, all of the the, uh, the, the book of Revelation is full of praises and full of very beautiful hymns. Um, when we get to the mention of the, um, of the foundations of this new city, the new Jerusalem, heaven, uh, we chant saying, I saw the walls of the city covered with gold and precious stones and beautiful jewels. And why is all of this beautiful? In the next verse, because our Savior is in its midst, crowning with honor those who love him. That's what makes the city beautiful. That's what makes heaven beautiful, is because our Savior is in, is in, is in its midst. Um, and as, as I mentioned at the end of the apocalypse, uh, we chant Kyrie Eleison in the long tune, and then the congregation is anointed with the oil of the apocalypse. This is called the simple oil. We have different kinds of oil in the church. We have the simple oil, this is the Apocalypse's oil. We have what is called the Myrun oil, which everybody knows that's what we use in the sacraments, like in, in, uh, in uh, the sacrament of chrismation. And then we also have something called uh, the Galilean oil, Galilean, or the oil of joy. This is taken from the Myrun, or kind of like the leftover from the Myrun, and it's used for different things. Uh, it's used, for example, in the, in the baptism. Um, so um, this is the oil that actually that Abuna would typically have in his, in his pocket when somebody wants to be anointed, he would anoint them with the simple oil or the oil of the Abu Khalamsis. We also have like the oil of the unction of the sick. So if somebody's sick, um, then Abuna would anoint him with the oil of the unction of the sick. So we have different oils in the church. Um, so. Okay. So Gergis, forgive me for interrupting. So yes, I was gonna ask you that question. So the 
I remember when you said to us about the unction of the sick. So that's a different oil than this one because people yes. told me the same thing. No, no. And actually, um, there's a big difference between them. This is a simple oil, which means it's not a sacrament. So uh, if, no. if, if somebody who is a catechumen, for example, or even just a visitor to the church, and he's attending Abu Ghalam Sisi, can be anointed with this oil. It's okay. okay. It's a blessing. Okay. But the oil of the unction, this is a sacrament. It's one of the seven sacraments. So okay. somebody who's not uh, a believer or who's not baptized cannot be anointed with the oil of the unction of the sick. They're, they're completely different. Thank you very much for explaining that. Sure. Um, so there's there's so much that we can we can learn about uh, this beautiful night. This is uh, by far my favorite night of, of the whole year. Uh, I look forward to this night from year to year. If you have not attended Abu Ghalam since before, uh, I, I urge you next year, now that you've, you, you know about it and you've learned about it, I urge you to attend it. If you attend, attend it one time, you will never skip it again. It's a beautiful night, a night of uh, praising, a night of visual, a night of... Um, lots of joy and happiness. Um, so I hope, uh, Yani, I was able to pique your interest in, in attending this night in the future uh, and to enjoy it. Uh, my only problem with this beautiful night is I cannot keep my eyes open there because I tried so many ways to do it. It's just, if you have, if you have a secret that you can share with us, please do. <laughs> I don't really have a secret because um, I myself sometimes uh, get the, uh, my eyes get a little bit heavy. Um, typically, actually, I don't sleep between Good Friday and Abu Ghalam Seas. Um, and if I sleep, um, I sleep for maybe half hour, one hour at, at the most. And it's typically right before I have to go back to church. So it's actually very difficult to get any sleep. Um, but the, the, if there is a secret, it's to be involved. If you are involved, if you're paying attention, the, 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 the most difficult part of this actually is the readings. And I'm not talking about Revelation, but the readings um, of, of the Old Testament prophecies, because they're long and there's many, I think there's maybe 10 or 15 readings. Um, and of course, if, if the reader is a good reader, then he'll keep your interest. But if the reader... Um, is mumbling or not very clear or his voice is very low or monotone then it's yeah. very easy to kind of uh, get disconnected and then you start kind of falling asleep and yeah. if you start falling asleep there um, actually you'll wake up when we get like to the third host because the third host is very joyous and we chant a lot of uh, hymns and things like that um, mm -hmm. So even if you start to kind of doze off during the readings you wake up again in the third host which is okay <laughs> Um, then after that, you know, we have the raising of incense in matins. You will not sleep because there's a lot going on and there's procession and there's prayers and hymns and praising. Um, so you'll, you'll kind of be okay there. Um, people tend to start falling asleep again in the revelation. Yes, that's what um, I always do. <laughs> that's what yeah, I because it's now it's like two o'clock in the morning or something like that. And, um, uh, at the beginning, you will not fall asleep because chapters two and three, this is when we chant, he who has an ear to ear, let him hear, so we're awake. Um, and then between chapter three and chapter six, there aren't any hymns, yeah. but it's a short period, so you're not going to really fall asleep. You'll kind of be maybe do, uh, <laughs> like dozing off a little bit, but you'll wake up in chapter six. That's when we chant uh, about the 12 tribes. The mm. problem is from chapter 6 to chapter 19, mm. um, because there are no hymns. Mm. <laughs> and actually, one time I was, uh, I was talking to one of the priests, and I said, maybe we should insert some hymns in some of those chapters so that people can, <laughs> can stay awake. Yeah. And um, he, was, he was funny. Uh, he said, okay, so like when we talk about the beast, we can have some of the deacons growl like the beast or something <laughs> like that. Um, but that's the, the, the difficult part is chapter uh, six to chapter 19. Um, mm -hmm. Again, if you have a good reader who keeps the people's attention, then it will be easy, but uh, it tends to be long. So what is the secret there? The secret there is to pay attention, to, to follow the events. 
um, one one year actually when we read the revelation uh, we had like pictures on the screen so pictures mm -hmm. of all of these events so mm -hmm. not only are you just reading uh, but you're actually seeing a picture so it gives you imagination yeah. of, of the events that are happening that would um, help. yeah so uh, pay attention if you read the revelation outside of the night of the apocalypse, like if you read it, maybe during the, the great fast or something, then you're more familiar with the story. So it'll mm -hmm. be easier to, 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 to stay connected because you know what's going to happen and, and you've anticipated it before. Um, but even if you don't try to keep connected, but I will even say this, even if you fall asleep during the revelation, it's okay. I've, I've told people, you know, bring your kids and I don't care if you bring them in, in their pajamas and their sleeping bags and in their slippers, it's okay. <clears throat> bring them to the church, mm -hmm. let them sleep in the church, that's fine, but they will still experience it. Even yes. when you are sleeping, you can still hear the music in the background. You can still hear the hymns in the background. Yeah. So you will still have that experience. And believe me, the best... <laughs> The best sleep you'll ever have is listening <laughs> to, to hymns in the church uh, yeah. because it's, it's very calming, it's very, very soothing, um, and it gives you a nice experience. So you'll have, actually have a good sleep. So um, it's I okay. Much, believe yeah. me, I enjoy very much that night. But again, my struggle is I fall asleep. And I, I would say it's okay. Come and sleep. <laughs> you know, it's okay. You will, uh, you will attend. Uh, some of it conscious and some of it in your subconscious, but you'll still hear it and you will you will you will enjoy it. Uh, for me, typically, what happens is I I can keep going, keep going, keep going. Even in the revelation, I can keep going because I really like the book and I like listening to it every time. Um, what happens is during the liturgy is that by that time I have kind of like used up all of my energy. So <laughs> during the liturgy, I what's happened a few times happened this year also um i uh, i bowed down to to worship uh during i think it was like the absolution of the servants and when i got up it was the end of the liturgy like i, oh. I couldn't <laughs> physically get myself to get up i can hear everything you're not really sleeping you can mm -hmm. hear every and i was actually singing the hymns in my mind <laughs> but I just physically, my body like ran out, out of energy. But then you go to communion and you're energetic again. So, again, yeah, I like the hymn that they sing at the end, Gergis. That's a beautiful hymn during the communion. Yeah, it's it, it's a beautiful night. It, and yes, it's a little bit difficult after we've had a long Holy Week and a very long Good Friday, but it's one night of the year, right? So, mm -hmm. my message to, to everyone come even if you're gonna sleep you know come and sleep in the church it's okay nobody mm -hmm. will, will will tell you why are you sleeping in the church come mm -hmm. and sleep in the church and experience it the first year you'll say oh i slept through it but i listened to it the second year you'll you'll pay more attention the third you'll you'll be more involved and so on thank you um any any other questions or very good quick question if you don't mind sure mina so what I know that on Bright Saturday, after we sing the M originally, we also sing Tene. But on the month of Kiyakiani, we also say Tene after we say originally. So my question is, what is the difference between Bright Saturday for that part and for the month of Kiyakiani? Because what I know this is, as I said, every day, every time we only say today. So, in other words, I'm asking, what does that have to do with Bright Saturday itself? Yeah. Um, the first answer to that is Tenen can be chanted at any time. Tenen yes, is, not, is not just for the month of Kiak and is not just for Bright Saturday. Um, so according to the rites, you can you can chant you can have a, a midnight praises on Tuesday and you can chant in in if you want. There's nothing that says that that cannot happen. According to economy, which is the management of time and the management of prayers, yes. Typically, we don't chant in because it is a longer hymn. 
Uh, we don't chant it in, in, like on the regular mid midnight prayers um, on on Saturday night. Yeah, um, except but, except for except for the month of Giyak. Yeah, except for the month of Giyak and and um, and uh, right Saturday. So um, Tenen is the same story. It's all about the the three young men. Um, yes. but. Um, there is no, uh, uh, there's no uh, right that yeah. says uh, it, it cannot be chanted uh, any other time, but the right says it, it must be chanted on those occasions. Um, okay. Because if it wasn't for those occasions, this, this hymn would probably be lost because everybody would say it's too long and uh, we don't have time for it. Uh, so the, right. the church chose that on these special occasions, that we, we, we pay attention, that we chant these hymns um, so that we can enjoy them. But I've actually done midnight praises before and um, like um, it was the feast actually of the three young men or the feast of Daniel or something like that. And, and we chanted. Um, okay. Yeah. There is one more question. I think you mentioned the Orthodox, the Armenian Orthodox Patriarch, and then you change it to the Greek. I think yeah. the Armenian. It's uh, uh, a room, so the room, I, that's why I said Armenian at the, at, at the beginning. Uh, room is Greek, so it's the Greek patriarch, not the, not the Armenian patriarch. Because I heard it the opposite. I, thought, I heard it, it's the Armenian, not the Greek. Did you hear it in English or Arabic? <laughs> I heard it from an Egyptian lady. She corrected me because I thought it was the Greek. She said, no, 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 it's not the Greek patriarch. It's the Armenian Orthodox patriarch what you said earlier. So I don't know. We have to go back and Google it maybe. I, from, from what I remember, it's Batrak a room. A room uh, is Greek, but we, let's double check on that. I'll, I'll double check and, uh, and, and we can um, yani, uh, verify that. Okay. In either case, yani, whether it's Armenian or Greek, yani, uh, it, <laughs> In either case, it's not the Coptic, right? But one oh, of the know. other, one of I the other Orthodox. I wanted to be the Greek, though. <laughs> huh? I wanted to be the Greek guy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, glory be to God forever. Amen. Uh, we will. Um,